All right, so today I want to talk a little bit about making the most of turning points, but let me start a little bit about with kind of some jobs that I've held and some that I still do, uh, and in addition to making slides that can't possibly be read. <laughs> um, that's something I seem to be pretty good at. But I've been a pizza cook, I've been a uh, um, carpenter, I've built hog houses in eastern North Carolina, uh, next to a fully functioning hog house that flushed out every hour. That's a fine job. Um, I've also uh, been an electrical engineer, designed computers, designed medical devices. Um, right now, I run a banking software company, so I focus on risk and pricing and economics and all that stuff. And then I also run a company that makes uh, a new form of lighting, uh, semiconductor lighting device. So we've spent a lot of time in research on material science and those sorts of things over at NC State. And so I'll hang up the phone talking with a bank president, pick up the phone I'm talking with a professor about a physics and electrons and holes and semiconductors and and also I help out here at Science and Math and uh, leading the charge to build what we call a fab lab here so kids can actually build stuff with their hands um, and my most recent project that I've been trying to enlist help from students here and over at NC State on is trying to build a sensory substitution device to help blind people see through their ears. Um, if you want to learn about that we can talk about that later. So anyway uh, that's me. Uh, life's a box of chocolates, and I tend to like uh, to lick both cones. And so I've shared this experience with folks. I shared it with folks, and they tell me your history. And I tell them, and they say, you seem like the Forrest Gump of entrepreneurship. I say, well, that sounds right, so I would use that. So I talked to Amy. When she asked me to talk, I was really honored. Today, after hearing the first three talks, I'm even more honored. Um, I don't know if I can keep up with that. So what will I talk about? So I said I can talk about banking software, I can talk about electrons and holes and semiconductors and all that stuff and designing products and, and ultimately she said well there's a room of, the, the theme is turning points, it's a room full of high school kids, uh, talk about the turning points in your life. So that's what I'm going to do, or try to do, and share with you at least three of the major ones in my life and, and hopefully be able to draw some lessons from it. That's what the bottom line there says that no one can read, it's like an eye chart. Um, <laughs> but don't worry about the slides. Um, I want to start with uh, my mother and father. Uh, my mother was one of six children. Uh, almost all of our brothers, she was the youngest, almost all of our brothers and sisters were in education. They were teachers, principals, etc. My mother was the exception. She wanted to be an artist, and uh, she went to school to be an artist. And my father was one of six children from Upper Peninsula, Michigan. My mother was from eastern North Carolina, Wayne County, where Shirley, Shirley and I share a home. Um, and my father was from Upper Peninsula, Michigan. His father was a Swedish immigrant that came over to work in the iron mines. Um, one of six children, all of his brothers and sisters were engineers of some sort. My father was a mechanical engineer, electrical engineer, and a really good one. Uh, when my parents were, when I was about two years old, my parents got separated. And it wasn't, um, it was for a, uh, the main reason my father contracted uh, or developed uh, a mental illness, paranoid schizophrenia. And uh, back in, even today, folks don't understand these things very well. But back in 73, they didn't understand it very well at all. My mother moved my brother and I back to Wayne County. Uh, and we lived near her family. Uh, now, my mother could have uh, easily said uh, how she could have presented the father, my father and the illness to me as a kid. Um, uh, she could have not understood it and said negative things because separation, all that stuff. She did just the opposite. Uh, she spent every day telling me about the great man that she married. She told me about a, what a magnificent engineer he was, what a, the great things he had done, uh, Polaris Missile Project, Saturn VI Lander, all these machines for building great things. But what she did, more than anything, is she communicated to me that that was in me, that I had that, and that I had this kind of hidden superpower. And I remember I used to have this dream when I was a kid that I was somehow doing some work, typically digging, and I find something. And that one thing was not magical, that it gave me a power, but it unlocked the power that was within me, and then I could do great things. She convinced me that I had superpowers, that I could do great things. And that served me well. I went to school. Anyone, anytime I was given a test on math or science or reasoning or logic or anything that... Um, fit into the wheelhouse of the superpowers that I knew I had, I would kill it. I would do really well. So I got placed in these gifted programs and whatnot. But about eighth grade, I was uh, in eighth grade, uh, I was completely bored with school. 
I missed 30 days of school. I spent 30 days in in-school suspension. I felt the institution had little to offer me. <laughs> and um, uh, I wasn't a bad kid. Uh, I, I would read books at night, uh, work on this new thing called a computer. I had a Commodore VIC-20 I, I would spend a lot of time on. Um, and, and I'd stay up late doing those things, and school got in the way of that. Uh, it got in the way of me learning more than anything. In ninth grade, I had a teacher. Her name was Miss Joyner. She's the second point there that you can't read. Um, she taught a class called geometry, which was an advanced class for Mount Olive Junior High School. First day of class, I remember this. I walked in the class. She said, uh, this is an advanced class. I'm teaching to the top of the class, not to the middle, not to the bottom. Right? If you can't keep up, go back and take algebra. My job here is to make sure that no kid is not challenged. Me and a couple other folks in the, raised up in our chair. I've been waiting for this. Game on. This gives me the chance to reveal and show those. This is, I've been waiting for this. I can show my superpowers now. Um, in ninth grade, I had 100 average in her class. I had 100 average in every other class. I missed one day of school because I was deathly ill. And the next year, I was president of the honor society that I'd heretofore never been a member of. So uh, there's kind of my second turning point is Ms. Joyner um, presenting a challenge and, and accepting that. In 10th grade, I started backsliding. I started getting bored again and started um, uh, not paying as much attention in school. And Ms. Joyner, among others, told me that I really ought to think about coming to this special school in Durham called the School of Science and Math here. I interviewed, uh, can't, got lucky enough to take the test, come do the interview. Interviewed with Ross Baker, who was a, a professor here. And she was a, taught embryology and evolution. And I told Flora that uh, I had been, at the time, I thought I was going to be an evolutionary biologist. I had been reading Stephen Jay Gould. So oddly enough, when you talked about Stephen Jay Gould, I said, how's that, how's that come up? And I told Ross Baker, I looked her in the eye, and I said, this school was built for kids like me. It was built to rescue kids like me. And she was nice enough to let me in. Now, when I got in here, <laughs> or maybe she wasn't, and other things carried through. But when I came here, um, the first, one of the first classes I, I was put in was um, we had this math class. They would do placement tests, and they put you in math courses. I got placed into Introduction to College Mathematics. Um, it was pre-calculus, basically. They called it ICM, I-C-M, because everybody has to have a silly name here. And there was two flavors of ICM. There was ICM and ICM Topics, because we were <laughs> completely anti-elitist at the school. And ICM Topics was really the honors course, but they wouldn't call it the honors course because you can't, but everybody knew it was the honors course. So I go to Dr. Gould, who since passed away, he was a math professor here, and I, the first day of class, I go to Dr. Gould and I said, clearly there's been a mistake. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I should be at least in ICM Topics, if not in calculus, because I'm really, I've never been. Dr. Gould said, let's just see how you do on the first test. And you're probably right. We might have got this wrong, but let's just see how you do. I took the first test, and I made a 65. I have never made a 65 on a math test in my life. Um, 65 out of 100, for those. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and I completely, I was thrashing. I was in the dorm. I remember I was over in, we called it New Dorm at the time. Now it's Hunt Dorm. I was in the pavilion. And I was like a drowning man slapping the water, right? I was like, I got to study. I got to work harder. I got to do this. I got to do this. I got to read more of this and do more of this. And literally, right before you go under, I'm slapping the water, right? This guy who I had met, uh, uh, Pete Houghton, Peter Houghton, he, uh, his dad was an immunology professor at Chapel Hill before you. Um, I had met him. He's from Chapel Hill High. He comes down. He's got a basketball on his hip. He says, let's go shoot hoops. I'm like, man, I can't. I, I told Dr. Gould, I look like a jackass. I got to do, I'm, I, I can't. <laughs> he, he, said, he said, look, he says, I, I know you. You got this. He said, you, these are just procedures, and, and all it is is procedures and knowing when to use them. If anybody makes it more complicated than that, they're doing it to satisfy their own ego, whether it's a teacher, a student, or anybody else. You got this. And it's like when you're thrashing and drowning, and, and, and somebody says, just float. And you lay back and float. He says, just sit in class and pretend it's your uncle telling you how to change a tire. Doesn't matter what the subject. Just listen and understand. I went and played basketball with him. And, um, and after that point, I never took notes in a class again, ever. I just listened. He stripped it down and made it naked and, and, and showed me. 
Here's how you learn. Here's, just listen and understand. And if it's anything, if it seems complicated, it's because they're making it complicated. Figure out how to use it, how to put it in your toolbox. So those were the three, uh, three big turning points in my life. And so what I'd like to do is I share those with you so I can give you some lessons that I think I may have learned from, from these. One is um, optimism is, is the faith that leads to achievement and nothing can be done without uh, hope and confidence. Uh, my mother gave me hope and confidence. I had a superpower, right, that I knew uh, was important, uh, that I knew I could do. And without that, I wouldn't have been able to get very far at all. The second thing is, and I actually use this uh, on my entrance essay to MIT, it's a quote from Teddy Roosevelt, he's always good for a really good quote, is far better it is to dare mighty things, to win glorious triumphs, than to live in the checkered place between, that knows neither victory nor defeat. You can read it for, I think you can read, probably read that. But the key thing is you got to dare mighty things, right? The confidence gives you the ability to dare mighty things. And I, as I was listening to yours, I was, uh, Meg, I was thinking about that. Um, so the ability to dare mighty, and daring mighty things gives you further confidence. So the first confidence is the scaffolding to build the next set of confidence, and that's the confidence that you can use to build the next thing. And then it's not just confidence that you have that can make you better, it's confidence that you can share with others, and probably most importantly that you can share with others. The next thing is we gain strength and courage by looking fear in the face. This is an Eleanor Roosevelt quote. And we have to do, um, we must do that which we think we cannot. You I found it helpful in life, both career-wise and otherwise, to put yourself in these fight-or-flight situations and choose to fight. Even when you win or when you lose, you get stronger, and you reveal more superpowers that then, and more confidence, and you can do more. The really big punchline to this is, is twofold. One is, there really were no turning points, per se. If you look back at the list I gave, there were people. They weren't points. And there were people that, through their beliefs, and behaviors and, and, and interaction with me profoundly changed the trajectory of my life. And, and this is one of the, the, there wasn't lottery tickets, there weren't, um, uh, I never scratched off a lottery ticket, now things are, are, no fairy godmothers, nothing, it was a constant process. And I think that came through in some of the talks today. Um, this is uh, <laughs> one of my, uh, Last thing is, is that you all will find that you either are now or will be um, one of those people that has a chance to change those lives around you. Uh, the dirty little secret about when I said making more, making the most of, of uh, turning points, it's really not about making the most for you, it's about making the most for others. How do you be that person? How do you give that confidence? How do you share what you've got? Um, this is uh, my son, uh, Peter uh, Houghton, named after my friend Peter who showed me how to learn. And um, there are people in your life that you will be the most important person. And there is uh, one quote I'll share with you just to, to finish on, um, is, to the world you may be but one person, but to one person you may be the world. And so that's mine. That's all I've got. Thanks, Ask.